day of Advent, which means Christmas is right around the corner. That's right. Yeah, next uh, next weekend, as a matter of fact. So um, this morning, we focus on love, represented by our special Advent candle, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And we carry on with our theme from Advent this year, Close to Home, which I think is appropriate as we prepare for celebrating the birth of Jesus and consider what home means, what home means for him, what home means for us. Um, just a quick reminder that this meeting is being recorded by the host or a participant. And also, if you want to text any prayer requests, you can do that to the following number, 559-290-5555. Uh, Oh, 06. That'll be on the screen in just a second. 559-290-5906 for any prayer requests, whether you're here in person, whether you're on Facebook Live, whether you're on Zoom, that's my number. So let me pray for our time. <laughs> God, we gather this morning to encounter you. We gather this morning to worship. We gather to hear and be shaped by your presence and with one another. And so we welcome you, ask your blessing on this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand for our first song, number 218 in the hymnal, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, I'm going to call up any kids, children, young people. I see Leah's already got the microphone. Perfect. Any others? I want you guys to come up here for a second, if you want. <laughs> or I'll come to you. All right, Leah. Bring out my So, um, oh, hi, guys. So, you know, one of the things that we've talked about during Advent is um, home, right? And do you remember a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Audrey had a book about different types of homes. Do you remember that? And there's all the different kinds of homes in the world. And there's even some homes in a little village right there. Okay, so we're going to watch this short video, but I want to watch it with you guys. So I think we're going to put it on the screen for all of us. Yes. Um, and there's sound to it.
they do that? And you've got the reading? Okay, you ready? All right, Leah, here's your microphone. During the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, we light one candle in the Advent wreath each Sunday. Advent is a special season of preparation, of hopeful expectation and longing for the loving presence of Christ in our lives. On Christmas Eve, we'll light the fifth candle. The fourth candle is the candle of love. God's love is like an open door. God's love is the street light that guides us home. God's love is like a warm bed to fall into. God's love is a table with room for you. God's love is a crackling fireplace. God's love is the sun that streams through the windows. God's love is the room over our heads and the floor beneath our feet. God's love is a home for you and me, for neighbors and strangers for family and friends, for enemies and partners. God's love is a home for all. Today, we light the candle of love to remind us of this truth. May it bring, burn brightly in this space and even brighter in our hearts. Amen. Thank you guys. And just a reminder to all of you that God loves you and so do we. I'm glad you're here and enjoy the rest of the service. A reading from Micah, chapter 5, 2 to 5. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth, then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth and he shall be the one of peace. If the Assyrians come into our land and tread upon our soil, we will raise against them seven shepherds and eight installed as rulers. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. And as we move to a time of prayer together, I just remind you, you can text any things you would like for us to pray together for to 559-290-5906 as we begin. 
And I invite you, as I offer up prayers on our behalf, um, that as we are thinking about home and about the advent of Jesus, that your response, our response together might be, come, Lord Jesus. So as I offer up a prayer, we can collectively then say, come, Lord Jesus, to that situation or to that need. This morning, God, we lift up the family of Marissa and Patrick O'Donnell, one of our Compassion Camp families. Marissa's father, Richard Keck, passed away suddenly this past week from a heart attack. God, we pray for strength, comfort, and peace for their family. Come, Lord Jesus. We pray for Sylvia's mom, uh, for relief from pain in her arms. Come, Lord Jesus. We pray for Olivia's granddaughter, Reagan, who's upcoming uh, chemo this week, um, that you would have no side effects and would be able to spend Christmas Eve and day at home. So we pray this morning, God, for Reagan, come, Lord Jesus. We pray for those who are particularly affected this time of year, reminded of um, loss, hurt, and pain. Uh, many people this time of year, that rises to the surface. God, we pray for those who need a special touch of your presence this season. Come, Lord Jesus. We pray for those, Lord, living on the streets. We're particularly mindful um, when weather is inclement like this, um, the elements to which many people are exposed on a daily basis. And we pray for adequate housing. We pray for care. We pray for intervention as is needed for those who are living on the streets today. Come, Lord Jesus. And I'd also like for us to take just a moment, um, in a moment of reflection, I've put on the screen, or had Jeremiah put on the screen, a picture of a blueprint. And hopefully you've seen in the lobby, blueprints. We've encouraged people as an activity during this Advent to make a blueprint. What does home look like? Or a home, or a space? And some of those are in the lobby. I encourage you to take a look at those. But the question I'd like for us to ask, and so I'm gonna just leave this on the screen for a moment or two, is what room am I making for Jesus in my life? We think of the different spaces of our homes, our favorite rooms we had the kids share. We have the rooms and the spaces where we sort of cram all of our things. We have our favorite places. Where does God fit? What might it look like to create a special place in our lives, in our hearts, for God this season? So I'd ask that you just take a minute or two, kind of with that picture, and think about your own life and the space that we make for God. Come make your home in us, Lord Jesus.
。阿门，阿门。A reading from Psalms 80, one through seven. The shepherd of Israel, you lead the descendants of Joseph, and you sit on your throne above the winged creatures. Listen to our prayer, and let your light shine for the tribes of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Save us by your power. Our God, make us strong again. Smile on us and save us. Lord God, all powerful, how much longer will the prayers of your people make you angry? You give us tears for food, and you make us drink them by the bowlful. Because of you, our enemies who live nearby laugh and joke about us. Our God, make us strong again. Smile on us and save us. The word of God for the people of God.
Luke 1, verses 39 through 45. Mary got up and hurried to a city in the Judean high, highlands. She entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. With a voice she blurted out, God has blessed you above all all women, and he has blessed the child you carry. Why do I have this honor that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Happy is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill the promises he made to her. The scandal of the incarnation, writes Kathleen Norris in today's Give Us This Day devotional. The scandal of the incarnation is that God relied on female flesh to come into the world. We gladly celebrate Jesus' birth at Christmas, she writes, but images of Mary depicting her baby bump can be criticized as sacrilegious. Contemporary women experience a dichotomy. As recently as 40 years ago, married women were forced to leave their Christian school teaching once their pregnancy became visible. So, she writes, let's celebrate Mary and Elizabeth, pregnant women greeting each other with the words God gave them. Both are blessed because they believed what God had promised would be fulfilled. Norris concludes her devotional with saying, let us be willing to use the bodies God gave us to help bring Christ into the world. Scandal, impropriety, shame. Our English word scandal comes from the Greek word, from the New Testament word. It's a contested term. Jesus warns repeatedly against being a scandal, a stumbling block for the little ones, the ones on the margins. Don't do anything to offend them, he says, to trip them up on the Jesus way. The word is also applied to Jesus, who is repeatedly called a scandal himself, the stumbling block, the disgrace for the religious powerful, the stumbling block turned cornerstone. The poet prophet Isaiah warns people walking in the dark that God will become a stumbling block for them. And then says, but the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, 
Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God is with us. In his gospel and in the book of Acts, Luke identifies three great scandals of inclusion. Shameful welcome. In Acts chapter 10, Peter is scandalized when his sermon is interrupted by people responding in faith to the message. Scandalized because these are uncircumcised Gentiles who've been excluded and now God is including. Luke chapter 8 tells us about the scandal of a co-educational school of discipleship that Jesus is running, tuition paid by the women who are following along with the male disciples. And in Luke 18 and 19, the third great scandal of inclusion in Luke's gospel is the inclusion of rich and poor together. The first story of a great rich ruler ends in sadness as he walks away empty, but the second has the glorious story of salvation in Zacchaeus' wonderful pre-Easter giveaway that results in enrichment for the poor. The old boundary lines, religion, ethnicity, race, economic class, gender, all these lines are washed away by Jesus, who invites all to belong. Little wonder that the first of three great Christmas poems sung by Luke and his characters is by a scandalous unwed mother, Mary. Little wonder that she repurposes a song, a scandalous song first sung by Elkanah's number two wife, Hannah, when she dedicated Samuel. Little wonder that this song has become one of the most popular Christmas choruses. Mary, did you know? The common version of a song that flattens out the scandal into a hallmark ready chorus. Mary's poem ranks her up there with the greatest of the Old Testament prophet poets who imagine a world in which God, Yahweh, is a real character on the world stage. Using Brueggemann's language, Mary imagines the world as though God, the creator of heaven and earth, Yahweh, God, Father of Jesus Christ, described in the New Testament as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is a real character, a real agent who changes things in the world. That imagination can only be scandalous because it rocks the right side up world of white, wealthy, patriarchal, cisgendered, heteronormative, consumeristic militarism, which is usually considered, recognized as the agent that determines all. This is biblical faith. It's biblical faith that brings a woman to proclaim the good news, salvation. And Luke is simply fitting into a pattern that was established throughout the First Testament. The traffic Egyptian slave girl, sex slave Hagar, the only character in the Bible to give God a new name. The one who sees me. Miriam and a women's chorus sing praise to Yahweh, the deliverer who liberates slaves from captivity. The prostitute Rahab tells the Hebrew spies in a condensed version the covenant loyalty story of God's liberation. Ruth resists the strongest anti-immigrant legislation ever known to become an ancestor of David and of Jesus. The Queen of Sheba never makes it into the story of the, the line of promise, but she's the one who declares to the all-wise, all-wealthy Solomon, the 
human vocation given to all, given particularly to him, to practice justice and righteousness. All of this Mary anchors in a promise that concludes her poem, recalling Abraham and the promises that have been given him. If the law of end stress is working here in interpreting the poem, we have to understand why Abraham's promise is the root of what Mary's talking about. So in Genesis chapter 18, verse 19, God is on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah and asks, would it be right to keep Abraham from knowing what's about to happen? And Genesis 18, 19 reads, no, for I have chosen him that he may charge his children and his household after him. Paul tells us that we are also included in this family, this line. God has charged Abraham to charge his family, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring about for Abraham what he has promised. the doing justice of welcoming the lonely ones, the orphans, the widows, the undocumented. Not only does Mary fit within this biblical theology, but using Hannah's song scandalizes readers ancient and contemporary by not only speaking hope to those of us who came this morning in loneliness, in grief, in mourning, but also addressing me and all the other big shots who came with thinking we have more accumulated wealth than our all too comfortable lifestyles can ever consume during our lifetime. This word is so scandalous that every commentary I consulted rejected the plain meaning of the words. That is the words that say things like, well, first it says, of course, the things that we want to agree with. The hungry will be fed the victims of violence redeemed, the empty filled, the degraded experiencing repatriation, the lowly raised out of the dump heap of loneliness, homeliness, homelessness, and hopelessness. But Mary also speaks with white hot clarity to those in power. The proud are scattered, the powerful thrown down, the rich have their bank accounts and Wall Street portfolios emptied out, the full have to hire themselves out to the fast food industry in order to keep enough calories in the system. It's a scandal, it's improper, it's shame. If Mary's right, and she must be right if Luke and Jesus who follow her are also correct, that it's Jesus who proclaims the year of Jubilee, sight for the blind, hope for the hopeless, freedom for captives. If Mary is right, then the only hope for those of us who are caught on the wrong side of the wealth and power, our only hope is to turn over all our values to turn them on their head and to engage in radical self-giving that characterizes Mary and Elizabeth and Anna and Simeon and Joseph and Jesus. The model we must emulate is the Lynette Madrigal who gives a year in her prime to serve American immigrants in Guatemala City. The minister in training on our scholarship brochures must be Sarah Gurley, 
studying in Elkhart. The senior statesman that I, as I age, hope to emulate must be Stan Friesen, Dolores Friesen, committing their lives to driving to LA and helping 85 plus Afghan families coming to settle in Fresno. And then whipping back to sit in a room on this campus in order to listen to the faith story of one of our neighborhood people wanting to join the church. The scandal of Mary's song is indeed that there has been a radical inversion of values, so radical that the collapse of wealth and power demands violent metaphors of brokenness, killing, and being straight, sent straight to hell, according to Hannah's song, or scattering the proud and emptying the rich, in Mary's words. Only such powerful scandal can empower us to treasure, share, and mutually carry the loneliness, the sorrow, the brokenness, the grief, and allow God's arms of love to wrap around each one and to treasure these stories and these memories as being a way in which God is present here with us. Hear the powerful revision of Mary's song rewritten by Jennifer Henry four years ago to capture our ears with the song that rests on traditions of thousands of years of singing. Mary, did you know that your ancient words would still leap off our pages? Mary, did you know that your spirit song would echo through the ages? Did you know that your holy cry would be subversive words that the tyrants would be trembling when they know your truth is heard. Mary, did you know that your lullaby would stir your own child's passion? Mary, did you know that your song inspires the work of liberation? Did you know that your jubilee is hope within the heart of all who dream of justice, who yearn for it to start? The truth will teach. The drum will sound, healing for the pain. The poor will rise, the rich will fall. Hope will live again. Mary, did you know that we hear your voice for the healing of the nations? Mary, did you know your unsettling cry can help renew creation? Do you know that we need your faith, the confidence of you, May the God that you believe in be so true. May it be so. May it be true. Amen. A very warm welcome this morning to guests and visitors here with us. If we haven't met before, I'm Audrey Hines. I'm the pastor here at Willow Avenue Mennonite Church. We hope that you will all stay and join us for refreshments across the courtyard in the fellowship hall immediately following the service. I'm also grateful for the many ways that so many of you give and serve this community. You give through paper checks in person, you give online through automatic 
uh, bank account transactions. You give uh, your time, you give your energy, and we are so very grateful. One example is that there's a crew coming first thing in the morning to help us reset for Christmas Eve. Uh, our Christmas Eve service is Friday night at five o'clock, and we hope that you will join us, whether it's in person, on Zoom, or on Facebook Live. We're very excited about this year's service and hope that you are too. Another example of the ways, the quiet, hidden ways that some of you have been serving is with our youth. Several weeks ago, one of you gave the youth some money and said, go take a walk and get a snack. And they've been hanging out ever since. Uh, another one of you has just jumped into the uh, junior high room and started playing ping pong with the kids. And we hear that some donuts just appeared one day for them as well. If you would like to spend just a little bit of time with our youth, please see Pastor Arthur um, as we are figuring out new ways to spend time and connect with our very special youth. Last week, the youth made toots. And if you don't know what a toot is, I hope that you'll come tonight and get a toot. Toots are bags filled with some nuts and some fruit, a very beloved uh, Christmas tradition that we're happy to celebrate this year as well. So tonight, um, the music program is at 6 p.m. This is a brand new thing that we're doing this year. We have how many, uh, Joe, how many did you say? Four, nine nine different uh, performances that we'll be uh, delighted to enjoy tonight uh, at 6 p.m. So Christmas Eve is at five, tonight is at six. And we hope that you will stay for a cookie reception and we hope that you'll bring cookies too. Blessed are those who make cookies, really. Like I made some cookie dough this last weekend and it took me three days to get through all the cookie dough, baking it, rolling it, stamping it. Thank you for bringing cookies tonight. We're very grateful. If you are rehearsing, if you are performing tonight, please come at 530. If you need time to rehearse, come at five or earlier. So says Joe, I'm just the messenger. Immediately following today's service, please clear out of the sanctuary. We love you and we wanna spend time with you. We wanna to talk to you, but we wanna do it over in the fellowship hall. The children are going to be rehearsing here in the sanctuary, and then we will be having our membership service, our special membership service during the second hour in the fellowship hall today. We are welcoming 14 new members to Willow Avenue Mennonite Church today. Isn't that amazing? I mean, celebrate a little. <laughs> Most of these people have been around Willow Avenue for some time. Many took part in our membership class that we held in January of 2020. And we got to that part in our process where people were choosing sponsors and forming discernment groups, and then we had a pandemic. So we are picking up where we left on off, and we're delighted to formally welcome those people today. Uh, just a couple more things, because there's so much going on at, in the life of this congregation. Next Sunday, December 26th, is not only Pastor Arthur's birthday, I'm told, but it's also a Christmas carol hymn sing that Joe will be leading and has put out um, surveys trying to collect your favorite Christmas carols on, if we can go, that's the one, on uh the Sunday that we'll celebrate Epiphany, January 9th, this, there's this little card that says tenderness here. That was my star word last year. Do you remember the star words? We went to great lengths to try to get everybody a star word. This was the star word that I got, and I put it here on my desk at home. Um, this is the Eastern Orthodox icon, the Virgin of Tenderness, and I happened to get this word tenderness. If you received a star word that was meaningful to you throughout the year, please let us know, email the church office. We want to incorporate those stories um, during that service. This was a particularly meaningful word to me and you'll just have to come back on January 9th to find out why. And then finally, we have in the bulletin, small little inserts about sharing through music. Lynn's got one, he's, he's just gonna wave it. Lynn's got one. 
there. We would love to hear from you throughout the season between Christmas and Lent. So we would love for you to fill this out, put it in the box in the back of the sanctuary. Each Sunday, we'd love to feature a song from one of you. It's a way of connecting and getting to know each other through music. And now I'd like to invite our moderator, Lynn Jost, and Bob and Ruth Enns to come forward for a blessing from our congregation. As Bob and Ruth come, we celebrate the lives of many who have participated in this church and have been very significant, but hard to find someone uh, more contributing more than Bob and Ruth have. Uh, they've surpassed the 50 year mark as members here, came in 1970 after returning from Japan and uh, doing mission work there. They've been in and out, and I hope you saw. Uh, the brief uh, recap that they themselves gave of their times in and out of Fresno uh, during these 50 years. So I have my own memories of the way in which you've contributed, thoughtful theological questions raised at church business meetings, wonderful contributions during the sermon talk time that I was able to participate in, your own hospitality shared with us, and your example of giving yourselves in service thoughtfully and extending the good news of Christ uh, in the name of our congregation and in Jesus' name. For all of those things and many more, we give you thanks. We bless you as you move to Reedley. We're pretty glad that you're still coming back, or at least you have been coming back on Fridays to Javier's. If you need a Bob and Ruth fix, that would be a good place to get it. I don't know if I can promise they'll be there every time we meet, but it's been good to have you. Thank you so much for your leadership in this church, serving as moderator, serving in many other ways. We're very grateful. Thank you for your time with us.
So let every heart prepare him room. We invite you, come Lord Jesus.